Thank you. I'm super happy to be here virtually and see you guys. <laughs> um, so the project I'm going to talk about is joint work from last summer's RU um, at Oregon State. So this was the first time I'd ever done a completely virtual RU program So I um, and worked with the students virtually as well. I worked with Adriana Duncan from Tulane, Simran Kunger from Carnegie Mellon, Ryan Tamura from uh, Berkeley, and um, we had a really successful project and I'm excited to share it with you. So I'm going to talk about the history of the Andrews Alder theorem and I'm going to talk a little bit about all the different um, proofs that went into the final resolution of that conjecture because we end up utilizing that work. So I'm gonna give you like some ideas of what went into those proofs because um, then it'll make more sense later when I talk about what we did. Um, then I'll talk about work of Kong and Park, um, building on the, the Andrews Alder theorem and their conjecture, and then our results towards those conjectures and some further conjectures. And then um, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some very recent work of Kong and Kim um, in this direction as well. All right, so a lot of this talk is gonna be pretty combinatorial, but I do um, point out when things are connected to modular forms. So we define a partition of a non-negative integer n to just be a non-increasing sequence of positive integers called parts that sum to n. And we're going to count, we're going to consider the partition counting function p of n slash star to mean the number of partitions of n that satisfy the condition star. So we could just replace star with whatever condition we're interested in. So for example, here when n is 4, we have 5 the five partitions of four. So if we just had P of N without any condition, we would get five. If we had P of N slash, you know, requiring odd parts say, we would just get two because we would have three plus one and one plus one plus one plus one. So partition theory is a, a pretty interesting area of study because it's connected to a lot of different other areas of mathematics and mathematical physics including, of course, combinatorics, but also representation theory, automorphic forms. Um, yeah, lots of cool stuff. And one of the very first identities you might ever encounter when learning about partition theory is called Euler's theorem. And it gives that if you count the number of partitions of n into parts that are uh, distinct, so every part has to differ by at least one, um, that's also called one distinct sometimes, um, <clears throat> that that's the same number as the number of partitions of n into odd parts. So the easiest way to see this result is by looking at the generating functions. Um, here we define the Q Pockhamber symbol. Can you guys see my cursor if I move my cursor around? Okay, cool. It gives me at least some, some control <laughs> for writing. <laughs> Um, so we define here the Q pop camera symbol by A colon Q uh, sub N to be just the product of one minus A Q to the zero, one minus A Q to the one, so that there's N terms. We see here that the left side is generating partitions into distinct parts because we just get one plus Q, one plus Q squared, one plus Q cubed, so we're only allowing one of each possible part. Whereas on the right hand side here, this is generating partitions into odd parts because each term is going to look like one over uh, one minus Q to the odd, some odd number. And that's going to, if you expand that out with its uh, uh, geometric series, we're going to get as many odd parts of that type that we want. Okay. So a particularly famous and well loved result in partition theory are the rogers ramanujan identities. Um, here they are in um, series form. And in terms of partitions, what this is saying is, well, the first one it's saying on the right hand side, we're counting partitions into parts that are either one or four mod five. And on the left hand side, there's a way to view this 
um, where you see that it's actually counting partitions of n into parts that differ by um, at least two. So one way to see that combinatorially is to think about um, a triangle. So the n squared you could think of as like a square of dots, but if you cut that in half, you get two triangles. You get a triangle with side length, a right triangle with side length n, and then a right triangle of side length n minus one. And if you put those two triangles together in the opposite way, so it doesn't make a square, <laughs> sorry, I can't write, <laughs> then it's forcing, when you add another partition from this bottom part, it's forcing a difference of at least two between all the parts, because those triangles are kind of compounding um, the difference between parts. So that's the first one. And then the second one um, not only has parts that differ by at least two on the left hand side, but the parts themselves have to be at least of size two. So you don't get a, um, a one part allowed. And on the right, ha right hand side, we have parts congruent to plus or minus two mod five. Okay. <clears throat> Now it might not seem apparent yet, but we're trying to build a sort of a, a pattern. So the following theorem of sure, it doesn't look as pretty if you interpret this, like in terms of partitions, it's not quite as pretty, but <clears throat> if we count the number of partitions into parts that differ by at least three without consecutive multiples of three, we get that that is equal to the number of partitions of n into parts plus or minus one mod six. So another way of looking at that is if we take the parts, the partitions of n into parts that differ by at least three and we subtract off the partitions into n of n into parts congruent to plus or minus one mod six, what we're left with is um, partitions of n into parts that both differ by three and contain consecutive multiples of three. All right, so we might wonder <clears throat> whether there's a better version, because this isn't as slick as the partition theoretic versions of the previous two theorems, we might wonder whether in fact we could say something like the number of partitions of n into parts that differ by at least three equals the number of partitions of some into parts from some set. But it's not true. <clears throat> Alder proved that uh, once you get past d equals two, so if we define q, little q sub d uh, superscript a of n to be the number of partitions of n into parts that are of size at least a and differ by at least d, then once we get past d equals two, it never happens. So that function can't equal the number of partitions of n into parts taken from any set of integers whatsoever. Um, so there's no hope for a better version of Schur's theorem, um, nor a nice theorem of that same shape like rogers um, once d is three or bigger. However, oh, and I wanted to point out that, so in the case where a equals one, where the parts are not um, restricted in size, that was actually proved 10 years earlier by Lamer. So Alder observed a different pattern though. So if we make a more general um, definition for the partitions into parts um, plus or minus a mod d plus three, and we call that capital Q sub d superscript a of n, and we define delta sub d superscript a of n to be the difference of the little q and the big q, with the same D and the same A, um, then Euler's identity in this notation is saying exactly that delta sub one superscript one of N is zero always. That was saying that the partitions into odd parts. So here, if we let A be one, then being plus or minus one mod four is the same as just being um, odd. So this was saying that partitions into um, distinct parts was the same as partitions, the number of partitions into distinct parts is the same as the number of partitions into odd parts. Likewise, the first and second rogers ramanujan identities can be written as an equality, um, a delta equals zero type statement as well. Here we have 
delta sub two superscript one of n equals zero for the first one and delta sub two superscript two of n equals zero for the second one because when a is bigger then we're forcing our parts to start at a higher place in this case too. And so that uh, second version we had of Schur's identity, it doesn't, um, it implies that delta three of one of n is at least greater than or equal to zero, that there's always more um, partitions of n into parts um, uh, that differ by at least three than there are um, partitions of n into parts plus or minus one mod six. So Alder experimented in whether this pattern continues if we ignore the second rogers ramanujan identity and just always fix our A to be one, he observed that for all N and D, um, this delta function should always be uh, non-negative. So any questions about um, any of that so far? All right. So let's think a little bit about the modularity properties of these generating functions. So if we look at the capital Q function, the generating function is always gonna have this nice form, one over these infinite QPOC hammer symbols. So like so. And that's always gonna be essentially um, a modular function. So in the nicest example, when D and A are both one, we have this quotient of, um, of eta, this eta quotient, we have Q to the minus one over 24 times eta of two tau over eta of tau, which is a weight zero modular form. So when I say essentially a modular function, I mean up to some appropriate multi, uh, multiple of Q power. <laughs> uh, multiply by Q to something. So for the function, the first one is also weight zero, the one above? This? Uh, yeah. yeah, and it's essentially weight zero, at least for sure, when A is one. Mm. OK. But um, I think in general. But now that I think about it, I don't know if I've thought it all the way through for when A is not one. Um, so in the case of the rogers ramanujan functions, we get like we have to multiply by um, q to the minus 1 over 60 or q to the 11 over 60, but um, it works out. Okay. Yeah, I spent a lot of time this morning actually trying to think about whether I could describe this in more detail. And as far as I, <laughs> cause I, was, I was unable to find like proofs of this anywhere, just like, you know, just references. Um, but uh, I think you can almost always expand in terms of a product of eta quotients and like a Jacobi theta. Mm -hmm. So if you do like a completion to make it like a Jacobi theta after you first consolidate and get um, the eta quotient part out, then I think that's how it works. But um, I'm not 100% on that. However, in the case with little q, it's very different. So we happen to have these equalities with the big Q in the case when D is one and D is two and A is one and two. So those cases, it's um, modular. You could think of maybe as, you know, because of that reason, but in general, it's not. So there's a conjecture by Nam about when um, series of this form down here have um, our modular forms. And so his conjecture is that they're modular forms depending on certain properties uh, related to block group. And Zagier proved in 2007 that no matter what you choose for beta and gamma, if they're rational, as long as D is at least three, you're never going to get something modular. So we know that once A hits three, we're kind of screwed as far as actually being able to say this is modular. Um, however, in 2014, um, Folsom did prove that when A equals one, the generating function um, for little q is a natural denominator for a class of mixed rock modular forms. So it did get you know, tied into um, the modular world. And she also analyzed the analytic behavior near the unit circle and um, radial limits. 
But because they have such different analytic behaviors, um, using that kind of analysis to compare the Fourier coefficients is difficult. So that's why we end up um, using combinatorics in this setting. Okay, so now I'm gonna describe a little bit about the different, um, different people's work that have gone into proving. So Alder's conjecture has been totally resolved. Um, and since we use a lot of these methods, I wanna give you an overview of how these methods work. So um, the first big um, breakthrough, I guess, in proving Alder's conjecture was by Andrews in 1971. And he proved Alder's conjecture for a certain type of D, for D that are um, one less than a power of two. So when uh, R, when the power of two is one or two, this is already taken care of by what we've seen. Um, R equals three, his methods don't work, but once it's four or greater, um, he gets this result. So <clears throat> we're gonna define um, little r. Now it might seem a little strange to do this because we know that this theorem is only going to be considering d that r 2 to the r minus 1, but we'll need it um, uh, a little bit more generally as well. So in general for a d, regardless of what d is and a equals 1, we're going to define r to be the largest integer such that 2 to the r minus 1 is less than or equal to d. So what Andrews does first is show that for general d, um, the little q sub d superscript 1 of n function is always greater than or equal to a different partition counting function, which counts the number of partitions of n into distinct parts from the certain set of residue classes mod d. So uh, powers of 2 starting at 0 up to r minus 1. And he does this using a very complicated to state, but but useful theorem, which I'm going to call the D equals E theorem. It's a pretty general partition theorem of his, and, and what it does is it relates um, partitions, the number of partitions into distinct parts from a certain set to the number of partitions, so it equates um, partitions into distinct parts from a certain set um, to the number of partitions into parts from a related set that have a prescribed difference condition. Um, so that's how this step works. And then the other main ingredient um, is what I call the ST theorem of Andrews. So he proves this general partition theorem that says, if the idea is just that, okay, if you take smaller parts, it's easier to make lots of partitions with them. But if you take bigger parts, then it's harder to make as many partitions of the same number because you have, say, you know, less wiggle room. So it's fairly intuitive to think about. Um, uh, but the idea is just that if we have these strictly in increasing sequences of positive integers that we're going to allow as parts, um, we're going to have more partitions or at least as many partitions into parts that, from the set of smaller numbers than we are from the set of bigger numbers. This requires the first, this requires that there's a one in the, um, in the smaller set. Okay, so Andrews proves this result by using the generating functions, subtracting the generating functions and using this kind of inductive argument. Later, um, when Yi's working on, on Alder's conjecture, she reproves this um, using a really cool combinatorial argument that we end up um, uh, liking a lot. Okay. So what does he do using these two facts so far? Um, Andrews uses the uh, S equals, or the ST lemma or theorem to um, define a set S so that the capital Q partition counting function is actually just equal to partitions P coming with parts coming from that set S. So in this case, we just want S to be integers plus or minus one mod D plus three. And then construct a, a correct enough T that we get something larger 
when we take parts from tea instead. And luckily, picking the tea that matches this L, this uh, uh, calligraphy L function that we had earlier works, that we get um, an S that's always bigger than T. So putting that all together, Andrews gets that for these specific Ds, um, this chain of inequalities holds with only one intermediate step between the little Q and the big Q. Okay. So next, Yi builds on Andrews's work and is able to show um, by showing that when D is not one less than a power of two, fills in all the rest of the gaps there, as long as D is at least 31. Um, so she's kind of a master at, um, at uh, combinatorial arguments with, that involve like injections to get inequalities. So she does use a little bit more intricate methods, but she follows the same general idea of Andrews. So the first thing she does is she breaks it into some pieces. First, she shows that if n is small relative to d, then you can just actually compare, you can get bounds, you can get upper bounds for big Q and lower bounds for little Q that show um, that this has to hold. The idea is that if, if n is small enough, there just aren't enough parts to, to, make, um, to make big Q very big. Then she uses the same D equals E theorem of Andrews. Um, and it takes what I would consider a substantial combinatorial argument um, using modular partitions. But she's able to do a similar type of comparison with little qd of one of n and uh, ld of n. But she has these two terms now. Instead of just ld of n, it's ld of n plus ld of n minus 2 to the r. And this is the same L as that Andrew used, Andrews used. So unlike Andrews, she can't just have one intermediate step. She needs a couple more intermediate steps. But just from series manipulation, she shows that the sum of Ls um, is greater than or equal to this generating function, um, sorry, this KD of N function, which has generating function given here. Um, and then using another slick combinatorial proof shows that the Ks are at least as big as the capital G's where G has a different generating function. Um, I found this proof really interesting because what she does is she manipulates this generating function for k's moves most of these. Um, so when we have a minus here, we're, we're getting partitions into distinct parts, moves most of these down, except for this one piece on top. Since there's just one term with a minus sign, you can interpret that as a difference between two different types of partitions, where the minus ones are keeping track of uh, one side versus the other. So she interprets this value k as um, uh, the number of partitions from one set minus the number of partitions of a different set, where these are just disjoint sets. Then she defines a third set, t, that's contained in the first one, such that the number of partitions um, uh, in the set t is exactly counted by the capital G here. Then she constructs a very intricate inject injection argument to show that, um, so since these are disjoint, showing that the size of t plus the size of s minus is less than or equal to the size of s plus, you can just move the s minus over and get the um, inequality that you want. Then the last step is to use the st theorem again and relate the capital G to the capital Q. So putting that all together, she has three intermediate steps instead of the one that Anders had. Okay. <clears throat> 
but these results hold once n is big enough. So that's why she had to do the small n's first. Okay. And then that takes care of all of the deltas once d is large enough, but there's a gap between 4 and 30 which weren't resolved. So to finish the proof of Alder's conjecture, Alfie's, Jameson, and Lemke Oliver um, proved the middle pieces by um, using asymptotic methods. And in particular, Andrews had um, conjectured a, a bit more refined of a conjecture that explicitly states when is it greater than zero, when is the delta greater than zero, and their, um, their work um, and also uh, observing that you can deduce the same from Yi's work gives this um, the stronger this uh, stronger inequality. Okay, so what do they do? Well, they use a very powerful theorem of Mayanardis, which gives um, explicit asymptotic estimates for little Q and big Q. But it turned out, and so Andrews had used this result of Mayanardis um, to prove that delta always goes to infinity when A equals one. But it turns out that the, the theorem was still true, but Mayanardis' proof had an error in it. So they corrected that error. Um, the theorem is, stays the same, so that's good. And um, so then they use that to get estimates for little Q and big Q and then computed the smallest n for which those estimates actually gave the inequality and then computationally checked the results for the smaller n. So in particular, they showed the following theorem, which gives this main term here um, in terms of this a function, which depends on a real solution to um, x to the d plus x minus 1 equals 0, um, <clears throat> between 0 and 1. And the main term here for delta is the same as the main term for little q. Um, so really, it's just that big Q has a smaller, um, smaller growth. OK. Any questions? So this kind of uh, major terms proven by some, some kind of circle method, or what the, the major term? Oh, how did my artist get his theorem? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I can't remember <laughs> if he used the circle method. I did look at his paper, but I've kind of forgotten. Um. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry, Les. Go ahead, don't worry. Yeah. I think it was in German, too, so I think that I was a, bit, <laughs> I was a little bit tentative about um, trying to understand too much of it. I was very happy to be able to, like, you know, translate just the statement of his results. <laughs> Just one silly observation, that number alpha is an algebraic unit. Hmm. I don't know if it means anything, but there it is. Thank you. I appreciate that. Maybe it does. <laughs> it's good for me to have in my brain. Thank you. OK, so um, so now I want to move on to what Kong and Park did. So remember when, when Alder was formulating his conjecture, he was basically ignoring the second rogers ramanujan identity because we were, he was observing this pattern that happened when um, A equals one. Um, so Kong and Park in, in 2020 wanted to think about if there was a way to extend Alder's conjecture to something that incorporates the information coming from the second rogers ramanujan identity, which we could think of as, as saying delta sub 2 to the 2 of n equals 0. So I, um, I was hoping to have lots of pictures, but I only got so many pictures. But I have a picture of Suni Kong. <laughs> this is Suni. <laughs> uh, I couldn't find pictures of her co-authors. Um, I know at least in this, the last slide is uh, one of her students. It might be one of her students and the other one as well. Um, but I couldn't find pictures of them on the um, university's website. So Kong and Park observed that it's definitely not true in general to just replace the one with the two in Alder's conjecture. 
Um, in fact, even the weaker statement, if we only replaced the one with a two on the capital Q term, it's still not true. Um, but they figured out that if you consider when a equals two, um, and then I'm, I'm giving these more general definitions when a is larger than two as well, because I'll, I'll want them later. So if we instead remove one of the possible parts from consideration when we define capital Q, so keep little q the same, but now we're, we're, when we count partitions of n, we're gonna count partitions into parts plus or minus a mod d plus three where we're not allowed the first minus a mod d plus three term. So that's d plus three minus a. So we're just gonna ignore that term. Now we have slightly fewer terms to work with. Um, it turns out that that's enough to uh, at least conjecturally say that delta sub d, so they're, they're calling this with a dash. So we're going to define delta d a dash to be q d a minus little q d a minus big q d a dash of n. So they conjecture that that is always non-negative. And they also worked towards proving this. Um, and what they did was consider Andrews's method for um, just, so Andrews had just considered two to the R minus one when proving those cases of Alder's conjecture. They generalized that method to um, two to the R minus two in this case where A equals two. Although doing that didn't give all the ends, it gave only even ends. So here's their result. Now, more generally, we're going to define, given any d and a, r to be the largest integer such that 2 to the r minus 2 to the a minus 1 is less than or equal to d. So if a is 1, this is exactly the same as we had defined r before, because 2 to the 0 would just be 1. Um, and then throughout, we'll consider r to be this. So we'll also generalize. Andrews's L function to LD to the A, we'll let that count the number of partitions of N into distinct parts. Again, all powers of two mod D, but instead of starting at zero and ending at R minus one, we'll start at A minus one. So if A is larger than it's larger than zero. So Kong and Park used the method of Andrews um, and their first step was to use that D equals E theorem again and they were able to show that little q2, 2 of n is less than or equal to d, uh, L sub d2 of n. But then when they wanted to apply the ST theorem, they needed a little bit more general version. So in the Andrews's original ST theorem, um, the, t, the smallest element of t had to be one. So that didn't work in this case. So what they did is they did this generalization saying, okay, well, if the sets start at two and all the elements of T are even and they satisfy the same inequality, then we get partitions of even numbers into parts from T are greater than or equal to partitions of even numbers into parts from S. Um, and they proved this generalization of Andrews's ST theorem by generalizing that slick combinatorial proof that Yi gave um, in her paper. So it's more general, but then it's also a little weaker because it's not holding for all n anymore. So with that, they're able to do the same technique, um, define S to be exactly the set they want so that partitions into parts from S is equal to capital Q. So plus or minus two mod D plus three, but now excluding uh, that first minus two mod D plus three part, which is D plus one. And then uh, forming T to be the set of parts that made LD two, and then hope that the inequality works out the right way, and it does. Um, yeah, so putting that together, they get the same type of shape as in Andrews's proof, but now the D is two to the R minus two for R at least five, and it's just holding for even, um, even ends. Okay, so what did we do? 
<laughs> well, like I mentioned, we had a virtual RU. <laughs> we couldn't do a group photo. <laughs> <laughs> so I had all the students send me a photo, and then my husband Anthony put them all together into this picture. <laughs> and yeah, he did a great job. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so here's um, Addie Duncan down here with the pie earrings. Uh, Simran's up here, and Ryan is below Simran right here. Mm -hmm. Um. This was one of the most successful REU projects I've ever had. And I just couldn't believe it because it was remote. The whole REU was remote. Everyone was super stressed out because <laughs> of the pandemic. <laughs> and I think you should be careful about using <laughs> the most successful. They probably won't give you extra funding for five <laughs> in the future. <laughs> yeah, you're right. They're like, you don't need to be, you don't need to be outside. Yeah, you can. <laughs> Continue just doing the successful IU like this in the future. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Well, let me just say, this was a very, it exceeded my expectations. <laughs> <laughs> I was delightfully surprised at how well we all were able to work together. Um, so, Oh yeah, and I wasn't even planning on running a project that summer, but some of the other faculty had, because of the pandemic, had to pull out. And so I took on students that I had already picked for somebody else. <laughs> that was the thing that was like <laughs> they were gonna do number theory, but it was gonna be a different type of number theory project. It was amazing. It was, it was a very cohesive group. It was great. Um, so yeah, so I picked out Khan's paper to look at. And so we were like, okay, let's see what we can do with this conjecture. So after a lot of work, trying multiple things and then, you know, realizing that we could make things a little easier, realizing we could do things a little differently, we ended up proving um, their conjecture for all d greater than or equal to 62 and n greater than or equal to 1. So this is basically kind of like Yi's argument, so basically like a combination of Andrews and Yi's, how we first did it. But then we realized that we could actually do it uh, a little bit slicker. A little bit slicker way. So the idea was um, if we compared the values of little q and big Q with higher a to, to a equals one versions, but allow the d to modify, that we could um, we could get this a little bit easier. So to get that result, uh, we used these two lemmas. So we see here that the A is moving down to one, but the D is now changing to something else. And now we're looking at multiples of A. So we have this version for Qs, and then we have an inequality with the little Qs, which is a little more complicated because it has these ceiling functions involved. But the idea is that there's an explicit way we can, um, we can relate these values by replacing the A with one. So we can also prove a slight variation of Alder's conjecture where we allow the D to change a little bit um, using the results of Andrews and Yee as well as their methods. Um, so the main difference here is that we need a different S set when we apply the ST theorem of Andrews, but we are able to get this inequality. So little QD one of N and big QD minus two, one dash of N. Um, we also need to generalize the ST theorem further along, along the lines of what Kong and Park did with two. We want to do that for a gen general um, multiple. So after some effort, we were able to prove that as long as the T set has every term divisible by M and starts at M, and we have the inequality, then for P of MN, we get that if the parts come from T, we have more than if the parts come from S. And this was also obtained by generalizing that same combinatorial proof of E's. So how do we put it all together? Well, we consider the parity of D and N. So there's four cases. 
Uh, one of them is actually trivial because you can't get anything with capital Q in one of the cases. And then when D is odd, um, even the other case is still pretty simple. It's a little more complicated when D is even, um, but we get the following two uh, chains of inequalities when D is even, depending on whether N is even or odd, using, um, using those comparison lemmas on the Ns, and then in the middle using this, oh wait, using the, oh yeah, so like here using the comparison, and then for the second inequality, using the Alder, the, the shifted version of Alder's theorem, and then a straight, um, a straight bijection here. Oh, this was the uh, one of the lemmas, which was a straight bijection, and then the comparison with um, the value we really want at the end. Okay. So it's pretty natural to ask whether you could do something like this for higher a, right? So we have the a, the a equals one version, we have this a equals two version, and you know what can we do for higher a? So computationally, it looked like just replacing two with three should work. Um, so we have a conjecture that um, that delta d three dash of n is greater than or equal to zero, at least as far as our com computations went. But if you go up to four or higher, then it's definitely not true for general DNN. Like every once in a while it's true, but not for general DNN. However, we were pretty excited to discover that at least computationally, it seems like removing just one additional part is enough to be able to generalize to an arbitrarily high A. So if we add another dash <laughs> and we define, yeah, notationally is, yeah, <laughs> what can you do? Um, so we define capital Q D A dash dash to be the partitions, the number of partitions into parts uh, plus or minus A mod D plus three, but now we're excluding both A and uh, D plus three minus A. So we're excluding the first occurrence of a part congruent to A or minus A mod D plus three. Again, keeping little q the same, uh, that we conjecture is actually always greater than or equal to zero, regardless of a, as long as a is um, less than or equal to d plus two. Uh, we can observe that these are getting progressively weaker. Um, so if we, you know, if we prove this conjecture, it implies. Um, it implies the ones with fewer dashes. Wait, did I say that backwards? If we prove the ones with fewer dashes, it implies the one with more dashes. <laughs> okay. So we try to prove, um, if we could, we try to prove whatever we could towards this, um, this more general conjecture. Um, and so we, we attack the general conjecture in sort of three different prongs. We use like an Andrews type method to get an Andrews type result. We use a Yi type method to get a Yi type result. And we also try to use the method that we ended up settling on for the Kong and Park conjecture. Um, but none of them are complete. So they only are giving partial results. So the first um, result towards this general conjecture is um, a proof for, it's nice that it's uh, for all n, <clears throat> so if a is at least three and n's greater than or equal to one, but the d has to be uh, at least 31a minus three and a has to divide d plus three. So that's like um, restricting a lot of what d can be. It has to be in one residue class mod a. But we do get the, the conjecture in those cases. And we do something similar by comparing to a shifted version um, of Q. So when we add the double dash, it's not D minus two anymore, it goes to D minus three. But using those same lemmas before and this shifted, this other variation of Alder's conjecture, we get these chains of inequalities and are able to prove um, the result uh, for multiples of N.
and when n is not divisible by a, then we just get a trivial result. So we don't have to worry about that case. So that's one result using um, the methods we used for the Kong and Park conjecture. Then we also try to generalize Andrew's type result, but um, we're only able to get n that are multiples of a power of two. So here our d is gonna be two to the s minus two to the t. And um, our n's have to be also a multiple of two to the t. Um, but you know, it works. It's not perfect, but it works. So this is following that same method of Andrews. So we use the D equals E theorem, and then we use the generalized ST theorem. The reason that the result only holds for N that are multiples of two to the T is because we're using that generalized ST theorem, which only gave us the partitions into multiples, um, partitions of N that are multiples of N. And then I would say the most substantial the, the, the result that took the most effort <laughs> was using the methods of Yi, because these methods were very intricate, as I mentioned before. So using Yi's methods, we were able to prove um, that for large enough D and large enough N, as long as the we're looking at multiples of two to the A minus one, we get the generalized conjecture. Um, the proof of, actually, no, it was just one of the, the proof of one of the pieces of this took like a third of the paper. <laughs> so we did a very similar chain of inequalities as Yi. We just um, generalized these definitions to attain, um, to account for the A's, which basically meant figuring out a when a one was really supposed to be two to the A minus one, and when it was really supposed to be um, a. <laughs> sometimes it had to generalize as A, sometimes it generalized as 2 to the A minus 1. Um, so then once we got all these functions, it was how do we actually prove all these inequalities? So the first and the third require a very substantial combinatorial argument, but they do hold for fairly general N and D. The second one is actually pretty straightforward. Um, as long as we're looking at, um, oh, I think I meant, oh, yeah, for this shape of D. And then the last one uses the generalized ST theorem. And so these are where the dependencies are coming into play um, on, on restricting our Ds and restricting our Ns. Okay, so then the last thing we did is try to use the um, results of Alfie's, Jameson, and Lemke Oliver to generalize um, the asymptotic results of Andrews that I kind of mentioned that had relied on this Mayanardis theorem. So um, we were able to prove that the delta with the dash dash goes to infinity as n grows as long as um, a is less than d plus 3 over 2 and a and d plus 3 are relatively prime and d is at least 4. So um, in the theory of partitions, Andrews's partitions book, um, we can actually get a nice asymptotic for big Q D of A. Well, it's fun to find. <laughs> so if we take the log of it, we end up just getting two pi root N over three D plus nine mm -hmm. from up here. And by work of Mayanardis, we get a nice um, asymptotic for little Q if we take the log of that, we just get the two root a n. And this a is the same as the one in the theorem of Alphys Jameson and Lemke Oliver. And work of Andrews shows that the a is greater than pi squared over 3d plus 9. So if we put all that together, we get that the limit of the difference in the logs is infinity. And so um, we can say that the limit of the delta is positive infinity. We didn't have the dashes there, but because we have this um, series of inequalities that are getting bigger as we're adding more dashes, proving it for the A without the dashes uh, is sufficient. 
and stronger, better. Okay, any questions before I talk about the very last thing? All right. So the very last thing I wanted to talk about was um, some very recent work of Kong and Kim. So in a brand new preprint, um, Kong and Kim start exploring even more generality around these questions. So they loosen up the definition of big Q even more and define um, big Q sub M of M1, M2 of N to be the number of partitions of N into parts congruent to M1 or M2 mod M where they're requiring that M1 is less than M2 is less than M. And what they prove is, um, so this is the same A sub, this is the same A that we saw before. Um, and again, alpha is uh, a real root of x to the d plus x minus one in this uh, interval. So what they prove is that if little m is bigger than the floor of pi squared over three a d, then the little q sub d a is gonna beat the big Q sub m m1 m2. And the opposite if m is less than or equal to it. So if m is less than or equal to that floor, then the um, then it's gonna go to negative infinity instead of positive infinity. That's the difference. So I thought that was really cool. And they um, in their work, so they used Mayan artists again in this work, and they posit two conjectures which are kind of like a reverse Alder type conjecture. So they're, they asked, okay, well, at what point, if we alter the D, when would the big Q actually win? So they conjecture one for D only greater than or equal to four. Um, if you define little m sub D to be this more complicated um, floor function, then they conjecture that little Q D one will always lose to big Q MD one, so this is like a plus or minus one mod MD. And a maybe slightly nicer version, but requiring a lot higher D, if D is at least 198, then you can use the floor of just pi squared over three AD. I'm not really sure which is nicer because AD is actually not very nice. So maybe the, <laughs> maybe the little M is nicer than the big M. Uh, <laughs> then they have this version as well. So yeah, kind of neat. And that's it. Thank you. Oh, any questions? Only if you go back to the previous slides, I just wonder for those numbers you come up by floor function, do they come up with those numbers by some computation or is there like a, like derivative to be zero turn out to be this value. <laughs> you see why I'm mean over here. Is yeah. there an explanation how they get to this is well, the there, yeah. there is some I'm trying to remember though. Um so they come up in so this comes up in the Mayanardis work. Um, and so this value here is coming up in their result right here. Mm -hmm. Um so it's actually kind of interesting. It's the threshold that going beyond is one story, going another way is another story, right? Right, that there's nothing in between. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that there's this like special bound where it, it teeters. Yeah. yeah. It looks like it's a parabola, right? You have to. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I can't remember off the top of my head exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I found it odd at first when I was reading it that they had the two different versions, but they do give some explanation as to why, but I just don't remember exactly. Okay. I have a question. Um, if you just look at this small QDA of N and the large QDA of N, so it seems that mod D plus three is uh, very special. So if you say, I, I, I still take on one side, uh, Q, small q, d, a, and on the other side, I take, let's say, 
uh, big Q but mod other linear function of D, then for example, if I take uh, let's say mod D plus three, uh, four or D plus five, then that number will be smaller, right? Then when you change A to two or three, that number will be smaller. Will will this equality still inequality still hold? Has anyone? So in this paper, they do discuss that um, based off of their work here, they can say that the D plus three is like the best, basically. So your observation oh. is exactly right, that D plus three is special. Uh -huh. um, I don't know whether they checked other than, you know, just adding a, an integer, but as far yeah. as that goes, yeah, that's, that's like the best you can expect for. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, great observation. <laughs> Uh, I have a small question. Um, so you, you mentioned that uh, small q uh, is when a equals one, I guess, like uh, for some proof that that's, uh, that's coming from a mixed modular form. So what about the delta in that case? Sorry, what was the last part you said? Uh, so can we talk about the modularity like uh, uh, for the delta function? Well, like what uh, Amanda Folsom proved? Yeah. So, or for delta. So for the little, so for little q, it wasn't actually modular. It was once you got higher than, um, once you got out of those special cases with like Rogers Ramanujan and Euler, where it actually was modular, it wasn't modular anymore. It was like a denominator in a mix, a certain class of mixed mock modular forms. So you had to multiply, like you had to divide. Um, it was like one over that time something else that was mixed mock. Okay. So it's a little bit more complicated to get it into that modularity type setting. And so it wasn't like modular enough to like help, if that makes sense. Okay. When you're actually subtracting a real modular form. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Has anybody explored the congruence properties of these numbers? Oh, not that I know. Well, wait. Not that I know of in this with these general definitions. So it sounds Shashika, like maybe. Are... <laughs> yeah, sounds maybe like... Tashika would know better than me. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a good REU project. <laughs> Is yeah, it, no. You already pick your IU project to be the new conjectures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing an RU project this summer. Um, I'm taking a, a break. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but I have lots of PhD students, so I am having um, one of my students right now look at this, look at these new conjectures of Kong and Kim. Mm -hmm. um, But it's a little bit, we're flying blind at the moment because we can't use the D equals E theorem in the same way. So uh, that was kind of a really integral part of all of these arguments going the other direction. Okay, so any other comments or questions? I just wanted to ask, um, <clears throat> Holly, moving from your results to the, the Kong and Kim results, at that point, the, the generating function for the big Q stops being modular. Um, does, that, is, does that fact present some kind of obstruction to your, your methods? Well, we were only, so we didn't use modularity at all. Yeah. So, so that part wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't obstruct trying to use what we had used before to tackle these new conjectures. But the biggest problem I see right now is, is that those first steps of using the D equals E theorem that Anders and Yee both used um, just aren't going the right direction. <laughs> they really yeah. wanna, they wanna take a little Q to something else. They don't wanna make something bigger than a little Q. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> 